Welcome to this latest episode of Clinically Pressed. On this episode, we took a trip up to Minnesota, um, into Minneapolis at the U of M Health um, Medical School. And so our first episode was with Dr. Shannon Holton, who is a hematologist, um, oncologist, and does uh, transplants with uh, the different things in those areas. And this was an extremely interesting episode really dove into the science of it something we hadn't really got into before but what really ties this all back around is dr holton's use of exercise and what they found in their frail to fit pilot study uh, with certain cancer patients it was really really insightful impressive and just again shows the, another aspect of the power of exercise and how much it can be beneficial to people in almost any kind of state of health so Highly recommend checking that out. Again, please check us out on iTunes. Leave us a rating and review. We are trying to give away these mobility kits. Uh, if you looked at us earlier this week, we got some social media just showing exactly what those look like. But all it takes is doing that. Leave an identifier that we can shout out on the intro, and we'll do that. Have you reach out to us. We'll get a shipping address from you, and we'll send that right to you. Totally free. No charge to you, but again, with that, highly recommend checking out this episode. Enjoy. Welcome to this episode of Clinically Press. We are up in Minneapolis at the U of M Medical School with uh, Clinically Press Ambassador Eric Tuhey. Uh, up here doing a couple interviews. Um, I'll turn it over to him and let me introduce our first one for the day. Uh, yeah, so uh, first one here today is uh, Dr. Holton. She's a now new associate professor Hello. at the <laughs> yes new promotion All in about the, the titles. Yes, <laughs> in the uh, division of uh, hem hematology, oncology, and uh, transplantation here at the U. I um, originally got into contact with Dr. Holton through um, a forum uh, done by Barbell Medicine and then I uh, started doing some research with her and was lucky enough to be able to follow or work with her for a month in clinic um, in May and yeah, thought she'd be a cool person to talk to. No. I still need to get into Barbell Medicine. I haven't gotten too many other things to listen to but yeah, I need to check that one out for sure. Yeah, they are great. So thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, thank you for being a part yeah. of it. Yeah. So what is a hematologist, oncologist, and transplant doctor doing on a clinically pressed podcast? Perfect. <laughs> Pretty weird, <laughs> Let's go. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's uh, such a unique time when we can have all kinds of interests, how they might overlap with our career mm -hmm. and, and grow your career in ways you didn't expect. So yeah, I met Eric on a barbell medicine forum. <laughs> Very random. Yeah, totally so strange, but awesome. For being in that close of proximity, right? Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, because it was like, you introduce yourself, and I was like, oh, I'm you know, a student at the University of Minnesota, and I was like, I'm, I'm at the U too. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> More than that, I was like, hey, you need to do a rotation with me. Yeah. <laughs> also a good way to do it. Yeah, so we're making introductions, and you know, Eric, University of Minnesota, I see this, I'm like, Eric, okay, if you're in med school, let us find a way to connect because if you're interested in sarcopenia, if you're interested in rehab, I have the patience for you. Yeah. So what I do in my clinical life is blood and marrow transplantation uh, by and large. This is a process where a patient typically with a blood cancer or some other conditions will actually get a whole new immune system. Hmm. Sometimes their, their immune system is replaced by their own stem cells and sometimes we use the stem cells of a donor. But either way, the process is pretty arduous and everybody ends up losing muscle mass, being fatigued and having all kinds of complaints um, that are very real and honestly very, very hard to deal with. And so as soon as I saw Eric's name on that barbell medicine forum and his interest in physical medicine, I thought, wow, I can really show someone who is in training just how debilitated a person can be. 
and also the hope that we can instill because this doesn't have to be a permanent state. It can take, yes, like weeks, months, years to come out of the transplant process, but there's every reason to think that we can uh, rehabilitate people and get them back to the quality of life that they want. So I reached out to Eric and I said, okay, you're, you're in med school, please come join me. Let's find a way to have you rotate on the BMT service. So we had Eric do two months on our inpatient, or I'm sorry, two weeks on our inpatient service. Maybe it felt like two months. No, 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 no. <laughs> it went, it went. <laughs> two weeks on our inpatient service, and, and what was that like? Uh, yeah, it was it was pretty eye opening, both from the sense of just um, just how beat down these patients can be through the process of going through the transplant and getting prepared for the transplant. Um, but even more so too, that what surprised me is just how positive a lot of them are, especially in this like. I told us in this early period when there's still a lot of uh, a lot of energy going going forward with them, uh, so it's it was pretty cool to see just how positive a lot of them were, even though it had every reason not to be very positive about mm-hmm. how things were going. I can only imagine. Mm-hmm. No, it's true. I mean, the the attitudes are really incredible. Um, these folks go through high dose chemotherapy and often radiation. They lose their hair. They lose their ability to taste food for a period mm. of time. They have mouth sores, belly pain, diarrhea, fevers, chills, um, you, you name it. And it's a pretty tough period in that a- acute phase. Despite that, you'll go in and people will give you a smile and a thumbs up. You know? <laughs> so they're, they're really all in. And they, they partner with us a great deal to try to get over these complications. They're in the hospital a variable amount of time. It could be... A week to 10 days it could be a month six weeks or more depending on the complications they went through what are some of the things that you noticed Eric about um, the physical therapy and the rehab that we provided in the hospital if you happen to see any of that yeah so in the hospital was uh, a lot of times I mean it with how busy it is uh, the therapist would come by into the room and if the patient wasn't there wasn't feeling good they just uh, wouldn't be able to work with them that day obviously and even when they were, were able to, a lot of times it was pretty minimal stuff as far as um, I mean, maybe light, really light stuff that wasn't uh, too much as far as therapy in, in my mind. But uh, yeah, it, a lot of it, a lot of I think the frustrations are from just the hit and miss of therapist finding the patient, patient finding therapist, and actually getting rehab in during that time. Yeah, I think that's accurate. You know, even though the goal is physical therapy, daily, that's what we're striving for, it usually doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Um, There'll be some procedure that comes up, they have to go to a test, Uh, the patient isn't feeling well, they just got some medication for nausea that's made them very groggy and it's not appropriate to do PT at that time. So there's a lot of challenges just even scheduling the PT, even though they're a captive audience, they're there 24-7, it's actually still pretty hard to schedule the PT. And then when it can happen, I agree it's pretty limited, and that's not the PT's fault or the patient's fault, it's the state that the patient's in. So their blood counts are very low, they're usually neutropenic, um, so infection risk is high. The the bigger risk to them in the immediate period with exercise is their thrombocytopenia, or low platelet counts, and a risk of bleeding. So we don't want to push someone so far that they're at risk of having a fall. That could be a fatal event if they fall and their platelets Mm -hmm. are low. So the, the physical therapy is designed to be very safe. You know, it's very risk averse and I understand why. Um, they have machines that are helpful for kind of maintaining some aerobic work, like a stationary bike, a treadmill. They have a new step where a patient can sit and move their arms and their legs simultaneously. Okay. Um, but I, I typically don't see a lot of direct strength related work and I presume that is because of the risk of um, microhemorrhages with bleeding with thrombocytopenia. You know, I haven't talked to the PTs about mm-hmm. this specifically, but I don't see a lot of strength-focused work, I think, because of that bleeding risk. So I just got a bunch of ideas. From, so, like, blood flow restriction training is kind of a new yeah. hot thing, or I don't know if you've seen, it's a rehab-slash-conditioning tool called, I want to say it's like the Vesper mm-hmm. or something. It's similar, you're saying, where it's moving arms and legs, but... I think they're doing some form of like kind of blood flow restriction, but on a lower level. So they're okay. just trying to like jumpstart the body's 
um, anabolic processes to sure. help. I just was curious, but you're obviously putting some sort of constriction on it. That would be a right. very contraindicated in that type of patient, or if it's because it's like low level, if they can tolerate it, or yeah, I don't know how much constriction we're talking. For you to do yeah, it later <laughs> in your it's career, another there project. You go. Yeah, I, I don't know how constrictive that would be, but I can only imagine what someone's arm or leg might look like with a platelet count of four thousand. <laughs> getting that done I, mm-hmm. i'm not sure yeah, I, yeah that's so far is. out of my wheelhouse that yeah yeah but, okay. we, but i think we we do have to have more to offer um so we have what we have and we have awesome physical therapists and occupational therapists and motivated patients but those are a couple of barriers to keeping people strong in the hospital so that even with the goal of daily pt people leave the hospital much weaker than when they came in and to be honest, a lot of people are frail even when they walk through our doors because of the pre-treatment they had even before coming to transplant. So they come in in a weakened state frequently, below their baseline, and then we put them in a situation where they're essentially confined to their room for up to, up to a month because of their infection risk. Mm-hmm. They, they can barely get physical therapy because of the the medical barriers of what's going on, the medications they're receiving, the low blood counts, all of that. Um, And then they're ready to go home. And are we surprised that when we see them in clinic the next day, they're completely exhausted and sometimes they're finding they can't even walk up the stairs to get into their house. You know, they can't do the basics of daily living that they could do before. So Eric then, after his two weeks in the hospital, joined me in the clinic for two weeks. And what would you say that experience was like, seeing people who were more in that intermediate recovery stage? Yeah, um, I think I was pretty fortunate, too, to see both, like, intermediate, where some of them were, yeah, you could tell, like, some of the energy was, was gone. They were, they were struggling a bit with some of the complications that were um, continuing, con- continuing on from the treatment. Um, but then also got to see, like, I think, I don't know if you purposely did this or what, but I got to see, like, several people graduate from treatment, uh, which is basically when Dr. Holton gives them the, okay, you're back to normal, you don't need to follow me anymore if you don't want to. Um, you can check up yearly if you'd like, um, but your no restrictions can go on back to normal. And that was a pretty cool, powerful experience. I got to see several times in just two weeks, which yeah. was, I mean, it was really cool but I also got to see some of the some of the ones that didn't go that route mm-hmm. which was like I said you got to you got to see both both ends of that definitely the best days in my clinic are when I get to have those anniversary visits when people graduate mm-hmm. so that happens at the two-year mark for our program if you make it two years and you've had no major complications that would need specific BMT follow-up, like they're cancer-free, they're graft-versus-host disease-free, infection-free, not needing transfusions, their chimerism, um, how much of their donor is now making their blood. If it's 100%, they're fully donor. They're off immunosuppression. They're off all the drugs I started. Mm -hmm. Usually when people leave the hospital, they're taking around 30 to 40 pills a day. Wow. So when they're off all of those, at two years, we revaccinate them because they've lost all their immune memory of their initial vaccines. We revaccinate and we say, congrats, you made it. You've you've graduated. From here, it's really just primary care follow-up or primary hematologist. Mm -hmm. And if you want to see us once a year, that's great. Um, the, the percentage of patients who make it to that anniversary visit and have me actually say those words is only about 20% though. So most of the patients are going to have some major life altering complication in those intervening two years, be it graft versus host disease, bad infections, relapse. It's a bumpy course for four out of five people. So there's still a lot of room for improvement in there. What we have for our patients who are still needing a lot of frequent medical attention is our cancer rehab program with our physical therapists and occupational therapists as an outpatient. And they do a phenomenal job. But it's really, you know, it's focused on is there a deficit? There, there's some work on general reconditioning and general strengthening, but I think, I think of PT more of if there's a specific deficit that we're trying to address. Still, even with our long-term survivors who have made it to that graduation stage, they still maybe are not recovered and back to quote-unquote normal. They still probably are feeling fatigued. Um, And fatigue is something I really just have to say is 
this is profound for these people. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been tired. (laughs) We've all been really tired, really beaten down. We've worked 36 hours straight or longer. We've, We've been exhausted. But imagine that is your life. Imagine that is every single day for weeks, months, years on end. So it's pretty brutal. Um, so if I, I tell a patient, okay, well, the best thing for you to do is to start exercising. They just look at me and they're like, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I, can't, I can't get dressed in the morning without being exhausted. Mm-hmm. I can't take a shower without needing a nap. How am I going to do that? So, you know, that, that's something that we want to try to help address that I honestly think as a, a trained hematologist, oncologist, I don't have any experience in this. But I'll tell you, the, the patients that Eric and I saw, the, the most common complaint is fatigue. Followed by that is probably pain, chronic pain issues. And nothing specific, really, just I hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, low appetite. You know, a lot of, I think, primary care folks probably are worried about the obesity epidemic. I get it. My patients barely want to eat. So that's a whole other different thing. Right. Um, so fatigue, pain, malnutrition, this is a daily battle for these folks. So what are some of the thoughts that you had in seeing these patients on, on things that the transplant world should be aware of to try to help? Um, yeah, I think um, like the big thing you mentioned, uh, like we do a really good job or like making advances in this kind of peri-transplant period where you, we you know, can do these amazing things through medical advances, but then when it comes to this long-term follow-up where these people are left with these kind of lingering um, things of fatigue, not being able to eat, we kind of fall short. Like we say, hey, okay, we've done what we can do. Um, the patient's left there feeling pretty crummy um, a lot of times, and uh, I think that's where like your, where some of your research has led now is like what can what more can we do like still obviously working on the transplant process, as I know you do a ton of research with that, but then what can we do for these patients after all that's said and done to help get them back to the best, you know, quality of life that they can they can live? Yeah. I think that's going to be hard on you, like you as a doctor and you as a soon-to-be one. So just even looking at, like, our team physician and the sports medic clinic he runs, like, sure, he's looking and he's figuring out the problem, but what is going to happen after the fact? Like, mm-hmm how is that going to continue to transfer over where trying to pack that into your schedule is probably impossible. Yeah. So So trying to find that team. (laughs) Right. We definitely need a team and we've got a team. You know, we do have a lot of resources. We've got an awesome dietitian. We have wonderful physical therapists, occupational therapists, PM&R. It's still not enough. Um, So, you know, being a physician, seeing these these patients having these very real complaints day after day, you know, what do I have to offer? So historically, I thought, okay, fatigue is the main complaint. Let's see, okay, can I take off medicines that are making them sleepy? Can I stop some of their anti-nausea meds that are making them groggy or their pain medication? What can I take away? But then I'm left with, well, now there's not a medication that was dealing with whatever, what other symptom was also going on at the same time. Okay. So what else do I have? Well, we have stimulants. We sometimes will use Adderall or something like it to help people recover a little bit more of that PEP when they're really profoundly debilitated by fatigue. Is that the right answer? I don't feel good (laughs) when I prescribe these medicines, right? right? Uh, Pain. I can give pain medicine. I I really can't give NSAIDs to most of my patients because of chronic kidney disease or bleeding risk. So I can't go to the simple stuff so it's opioids a lot of the time because of the risk of drug interactions otherwise. Malnutrition, what do I do there? We have appetite stimulants with their crap. I mean, they just really don't work very well. So the tools in my toolbox in in dealing with these are so, so limited. Mm -hmm. I got really tired, and I'm still very tired of giving these medications knowing that they really don't have a very big benefit. Mm -hmm. What I thought after a while is they, they don't need me for this they need a coach yeah and I know one <laughs> so this this takes me back then to a few years ago okay. when, when I joined the Minnesota program here um, I'd moved from Oregon and you know making a fresh start 
kind of getting a lot of things in my life figured out. I knew who I was academically. I didn't know who I was health-wise for myself. So just trying to, to do a little bit of soul searching there. I joined a gym because, well, I'm a doctor and I know you're supposed to exercise. <laughs> I know, Amen. Right? Uh, yes, preach. But, yes, exercise Tell all our athletes good for you either keep working out or you stop completely. Don't start and stop, but just keep going because it hurts right. too much otherwise. It does. Ugh. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to join a gym. I will get back into an exercise habit. I had one in the past. It really fell apart for me during residency fellowship. You're just so busy clinically. I, I didn't do a good job of self-care at all <laughs> during that time. I've also heard that stuff. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to figure out my own health and I will be a better physician if I can take care of myself so I joined a gym fully intent on you know doing the cardio equipment Mm -hmm. like that was the plan half hour 45 minutes on the elliptical whatever three to four times a week cool that'll feel good (laughs) but you know joining the gym I, I got to connect with some trainers there and they give a discount to start so I'm like okay fine clearly What I am doing is not adequate. Yes, I'm a physician. I should know what to do. But, like, let's look at this. Maybe maybe I'll just go ahead and see a trainer for a little while. Whatever. It's it's no big deal. So I I got connected to this trainer who was, you know, such a terrific guy. um, But also didn't take any of my BS. (laughs) That's a good... appreciated that you know I told him about my diet which was largely carbohydrate based so I was practically vegetarian at the time and you would think that would mean healthy well like most of my diet was pasta or grains or whatever which fits the bill but yeah. not necessarily <laughs> no so I, I hardly ever ate meat um a lot just you know high high 80 percent carb diet fatigued all the time of course mm-hmm. uh with that and then hadn't done any real weightlifting. So he, he said, okay, well, let's try a couple of things. Maybe just try my suggestions for a month. I know I'm not a doctor, but maybe if you just try what I've seen work, <laughs> maybe you'll see how you feel. And I was willing to do that experiment. So he put me on a, a diet that completely blew my mind. It was really pretty high fat. Mm-hmm. Um, so most of my calories came from fat and then much higher protein gave me permission to go ahead and eat more meat and my carbohydrate content went way down um and I felt crappy for a couple of weeks but then after that really started to feel a lot better and noticed that I wasn't riding this roller coaster where you know a little spike of energy and then a crash where I'd feel like I had to take a nap every afternoon so that that didn't happen anymore and then gradually started lifting weights and feeling muscles developing (laughs) this is cool so I'm not as tired. I feel like I can do more. I, you know, I don't really have any aches or pains anymore. Um, maybe this would be good for my patients too. So after a while of having these thoughts and talking to my coach, uh, Jason, about my experience as a, as a physician for these patients and reflecting on my experience with him as my coach, I thought, you know what, what we need honestly is you. And, and how do we start that process? How can we show that what you have done for me would really do a lot of good for transplant recipients as well? So over the course of a couple years of training together, because we'd always talk while I was training with him, right. <laughs> we kind of came up with this crazy idea that, well, let's go ahead and write a grant to see if we can get some funding to take his knowledge and apply it to my transplant patients. And the first time we submitted the grant, we were rejected, but that's okay. Rejection always makes you more motivated, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, it is common in the grant process. So. <laughs> yeah, so I'm definitely used to rejection. Uh, so <laughs> we, we thought about it again, kind of reformulated some of the ideas, and then we had an opportunity to come up to apply for a grant through a group called Marrow on the Move. So Marrow on the Move is a nonprofit organization that's based out of the U of M here, University of Minnesota. Okay. Um, and they fund pilot projects that are designed to directly help patients. So we got our pilot grant from them after applying, and we designed a simple study. It's basically a baseline assessment of overall strength and a variety of different measurements, um, as well as kind of baseline markers of um, things that you would think about in terms of health blood sugar, lipids, you know, your cholesterol levels, hemoglobin A1C, 
kind of just a general health Gen- panel. General health panel. Yeah. Also looking at like high sensitivity CRP. Our transplant survivors, even if they've made it through all this and they're off their medicines, they still have about a nine-fold increased risk of cardiovascular mortality. Okay. So checking some of those labs and looking for other biomarkers of aging, um, accelerated aging and inflammation. So taking a good baseline look at patients. And then uh, based upon that baseline strength assessment in particular, Jason then designed a 10-week program for each of the patients. Okay. Now, one of the key points here was each of the patients also had a control with them. So a non-transplant recipient was paired with them. The, the patient had to bring in their own control. So in most cases, it was their spouse. Okay. In one case, it was a father-daughter combo. Okay. And so that was cool. What the, yeah, what yeah. having that control allowed us to do was to measure the, the magnitude of benefit. So we know that a healthy individual exercising X amount should see Y gains, mm-hmm. basically. So could we see that same magnitude with someone who's been through a transplant? So he designed the 10-week program that was personalized for everybody. Nobody had the same program, which is key, right? It was dosed appropriately right so we think of that in medicine all the time i better give the right dose of chemotherapy and that dose is based upon a lot of different factors you know age kidney function weight other things right so we we need to keep in mind the dose well i think the same must be true for exercise right so this is why exercise fails in the physician's hands i don't know how to dose exercise (laughs) I'll tell my fatigue patient, go ahead, go exercise, do something. Right. <laughs> but maybe it's not the right thing for right. them. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's enough factors in that, too. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's nuanced enough. You should have a professional dose your exercise when you're just starting out, especially. Mm-hmm. So he dosed everybody's exercise, had a program set up. Um, all of the participants in the study had to um, do their programs together as a group at least once per week. So that was the minimum requirement. They had to be in one time per week. They were invited to come back more times if they had time, if they wanted to, and there would be updated individual programs for them at each time. So the the participants could at will do more work if they wanted to. And interestingly enough, everybody did more work. So they had so much fun. Most of the participants were in about three times a week and happy about it. And my coach was like, These people are crazy. They actually want to be here. (laughs) They seem to be enjoying this. Where did you find them? Like, well, they're they're motivated. They they get it. Right. Right. Whereas, you know, for some of us who are lucky enough to not be unwell or have major health complications, it's working out as a pain. Well, to them, it's life. And this was an amazing opportunity. And they they took full advantage of it. So it was so cool. They were all motivated. Went in, just guns blazing, here to work, and having a great time with it. Um, and then at the end of the 10-week individualized sessions, they had another assessment to see mm-hmm. you know, what kind of progress they made. So um, what we saw was progress in every area that we expected to, right? So um, the average participants doubled their strength across the board, upper body, lower body, all of that was great. Um, a measurement of self-efficacy, you know, how you feel that, can you tackle the, the problems of the day? Can you, do you feel like you can conquer what you need to in your daily life? That all improved. Um, so I was very, very happy with that. Interestingly, not a big change in blood sugar, cholesterol. That's okay. You know, th- there are other markers that are maybe more meaningful, mm-hmm. and we're still trying to tease some of those out. So our work looking at biomarkers of accelerated aging and inflammation, those are still being researched. But it was a strong enough signal just simply from the strength and self-efficacy standpoint that we were like, yes, this is actually really where we want to go. So importantly with this, we said this is not a weight loss study. You know, we, we don't want you to come in here and lose weight that's not the goal right um but we we did help them with nutrition we had some nutrition coaching okay um and general guidelines on what people should be eating and and what do you think they were eating to begin with any guesses probably hard carbohydrate 80 percent carbs (laughs) just like i used to figure yeah yeah like lots of cereals breads you know the processed stuff um, and one of our dietitians just did some very simple uh, educational talks, and honestly, it's more like roundtable discussions on 
this is this is how to eat food again. This right. is what food should be. Um, we take this for granted, but when when we're starting our patients off in BMT, they're actually told to avoid a lot of foods that we think would be healthy because of an infection risk. So, you know, fruits that you can't wash very well, they're out the window. Um, hmm. Raw vegetables, nope. So there's this whole kind of culture built around the neutropenic diet, reducing your infection risk through nutrition. We have to undo that. <laughs> and even now on our BMT unit, we're starting to allow more fruits and vegetables. We, you know, we're still careful about that infection risk. Right. But even though they're not neutropenic anymore, this is years later, they're still following that. So they're still right, eating right. You know, like largely processed food. So just showing, nope, this is, this is what food really is. And you can shop and you can cook this way. And making those changes was huge for them. One of our controls, you know, again, this is not a weight loss study, but she lost 25 pounds. Right. <laughs> She's just like, wow, this is okay. Now I understand what, what healthy eating is and totally changed her diet. And, you know, you know, it looks incredible. So she has just made such a change uh, for the better for her life. You know, feels amazing. So it, it was just a great experience all around. Um, the average patient gained three pounds of lean muscle during this process. Solid over 10 weeks. Solid over 10 weeks, right? I'm pretty happy to gain yeah. three pounds of lean muscle mass in 10 weeks. Um, so they. How did they, you guys measure that? Just out of curiosity. Oh, not, not invasively, just with this in body instrument. Okay, yeah, I just was curious what you guys have seen some people that use other tools. That <laughs> yeah. Yes. Anyhow, Definitely. Just, anyway, I've been no, I've heard good time, things about that but one. Yeah, I just I wanted to share that it, just in general, the process was so positive mm -hmm. that um, it's clear that this type of team is what we really need in BMT. So in the acute care setting, what Eric saw in the hospital, I don't know how we can improve much upon that, to be honest. They are sick. I, I don't think we can really make huge changes in that space because of the intensity of what they're going through with their chemotherapy and radiation, the infection risks, everything. The, the meds are so, and I don't know how we can physically improve upon that too much more. It just is what it is. So I, you haven't said the word because it's the buzzword in nutrition, like ketogenic. Yeah. It seemingly is kind of what it sounds like yeah. to some degree. I don't know if you've heard Don Diagostino the name. He's a researcher down at Central Florida, does a ton of work with the ketogenic diet and cancer. Sure. Um, and having a lot of success with just having a cumulative effect with that on top of like adding the traditional like chemo where yeah. I think, and I'm sorry, this is probably so dumbed down, but I'm going to say it anyway, like almost kind of starve, helping starve the cells out because you're not feeding it with you know, high levels of carbohydrates and simple sugars that, in theory, could help those things yeah. thrive, which you don't want. But I was just curious, yeah, like, where if... It's a fair question. So the patients, you know, in that pre-transplant time, or even later, they will ask what they can eat mm -hmm. to reduce their cancer risk, to avoid a relapse. How do I eat to, to avoid that complication? And I don't have a good answer for them. Um, I think that the ketogenic diet is interesting and it should definitely be studied. Yeah. Like, there are some good studies that are happening right now that should help us. I think the area where I get most frustrated is um, I don't want anyone to ever feel shame for what they eat. You know, our, our patients didn't ask for leukemia. There's nothing they did that really brought this on. Right. right? And, and sometimes you're just struggling to make calories. You know, even to to get in 50% of what you need. And so if it's ice cream three meals a day, fine by me, mm -hmm. right? So I just don't want feel I don't want people to feel bad for what they can eat because everything else is just absolutely not palatable at right. that time. No, that makes complete sense. And, and sadly that happens. Oh, I, I shouldn't have had that. That's feeding the cancer. We need more research. Yeah. yeah. So and there's the mental yeah. Health aspect of yeah, it too. Definitely. That's my argument for why I consume certain <laughs> yeah. things. So, like, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of like sad, joy, too. pleasure. So you know, I I don't tell people to restrict those those types of things. Certainly in the acute setting, but once you're more recovered, you know, this is where the study that we're doing I, I hope can help build some bridges between us and the medical profession and then the health community. Mm -hmm. um, 
Eric, I'm sure you're seeing this too as a med student and the impact that we have in our patients' lives. Honestly, we play such a small part in their health. We, we think we're a pretty big deal, <laughs> but we're not. Yeah. We're really not. And, and that's, that's the way it should be. You know, I want our patients to come in, let us help with these really devastating problems. But then honestly, the, the majority of the work, the true healing doesn't happen here. I don't feel like I'm actually really healing anything. Yes, I can address a, a major problem and help someone through this part, but you know, true recovery is something that then goes on for years and it has to involve the greater community. So I, I don't want my patients who are two years and greater post-transplant coming back to me for an exercise prescription you know, that's coming back to the, the medical realm, the office, right. and then it's it's just focused on the patient. I ideally want my patients and their whole families to get back to their health, which is a very different thing in the context of a community setting where they're surrounded by peers, you know, peers both on the patient side, but then also peers on the caregiving side, where they can actually relate to each other, support each other, learn from each other and then continue to heal from everything that they went through. So setting up a program such as the study that we have set up, I think can help bridge that gap from the medical community to them, you know, being healthy throughout the rest of your life, which is really the, the goal. Mm -hmm. So we were lucky to get more funding to be able to reopen the study. So that's the next step is that, yeah. bigger bigger subject group definitely so it's absolutely the next step uh, we're expanding beyond BMT so anyone who's had multi-agent chemotherapy they're at the same risk of accelerated aging cardiovascular disease and and poor outcomes in terms of fatigue and quality of life as well so this will be expanded um, and basically I, I hope at the end of the day that we can establish this really clean link between us and the medical community and then you know just life <laughs> <laughs> but but learning how to do this um, for, for the rest of their lives. So I, I love strength training. I would kind of love to get really nerdy about it and try to prescribe what patients should do. But honestly, that's not really my training. I'm, I would probably really need to retool my background and spend a lot of time learning. Maybe I should just rely on the it's excellent trainers. <laughs> it is, which has been fun, you know, to get mm -hmm. into. A oh, for bit. sure. But I realize I'm just dabbling, and you know, now that I, I do have confidence that there are terrific coaches out there who can take the ball and run with it once we hand it off. I think you know that's what we need to do as a healthcare profession. I think just even talking about it, like for the ones that we're in a force to listen to this because we teach them in class but <laughs> other ones like if you're looking for a niche to like really specialize in something because you know to go get a personal trainer mm -hmm. certification is three hours and a couple hundred mm -hmm. bucks where you can get really good mm -hmm. like the coach you were talking about and yeah find your way into some of these avenues where yeah maybe you're not a physical therapist or an occupational therapist but there still can be a place and then when you find physicians that are open to that, mm -hmm. that's when things happen. Yeah. yeah, very much so. So it's been a really fun process and, and something that's been, you know, not my main focus of research for sure, but definitely my most fun angle to research <laughs> right now. I can believe that. Because <laughs> the other thing that was cool is I would go to the gym when they were working out. I'd see them. They'd see me. I'd show them my program. See, I'm doing a program too. You know, it looks slightly different than yeah. yours, but I'm, I'm still doing the same process. And it's really fun. And it's, it's for everybody. I'm sure the credibility that gives you too. Yeah. Just for them to see that and go, okay, they're buying what they're selling too, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. important. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's really a different thing than just going and working out on the treadmill or the right. elliptical for 45 minutes a day. Because that's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's just hard to measure progress. So, you know, for me personally, it's been great to just know that I, I can, if you needed me to pick up more than 300 pounds off the floor right now, I could do that. So knowing that I can do that means I have the confidence to tackle a whole lot of other big things. So I'm not really stymied by a lot of problems or barriers. Like, I'm not 
paralyzed by it. I'll take it on. Mm -hmm. Um, It was fun to see the study participants kind of have that same aha moment, too. Um, One of our patients really loved to hunt, and, and he would go out and you know, be prepared to kind of have a miserable walk because it was so hard to. Right. Um, you'd have all these other implements, a cane, and just, you know, be prepared. This can be hard. Well, he was on our study and a little bit more than halfway through when he had his annual hunting trip this last year. And a few steps in, he was like, wow, I don't need this cane. Chucked it. Yeah, moving that's going to be a good feeling. <laughs> just, yeah. just that little bit of strength make that huge difference yeah it really does so there's you know no pill that will ever be able to do that for a person i don't think um so it it has to involve a professional it has to involve correctly dosed exercise and then be done in a community setting where people can take this and then continue it for the rest of their lives with their families because the caregivers go through hell too Mm -hmm. you know they lose a lot of their health as well. oh for sure so, like, let's figure out this, this program and then help whole families recover from this and, you know, hopefully be able to continue to do the things they want, not interacting with me because I, I love my patients. Right. But it's a, it's a great day when I can say, you don't need me. You don't need these meds. Oh, I can sure. stop these meds. We're now in the friend zone. We'll see you there. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Making yourself obsolete to them. That's mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really the goal. So I knew that we really had to start building these types of programs when I was trying to demonstrate glute bridges in the office. It's like, you know what? Look, I just, I need to get you to a coach. (laughs) (laughs) It's probably not right for me to be doing this right now. (laughs) But just, you know, talking about what what is important, what matters to our patients. Um, I can see you walking down to the rehab area and (laughs) demonstrating (laughs) push presses or something (laughs) in your lab coat or something. I could see that happening. How about an extra stretchy coat for that reason? Yeah, right? Right, I wish. So, you know, as we're thinking about these programs, Eric, what do you think our patients would benefit most from uh, in terms of this, this focused rehab? I have a bias after watching these patients for so long and then also doing this program but like kind of what do you see is the the next thing that we should be having people focus on as far as like the type of exercise or yeah, like just the, the type the general type or muscle groups or yeah what matters yeah. for quality of life yeah i think um the big things like you said i, I don't think like uh, walking on a stair step or for an hour is going to change much for these patients, but I think like the, um, like I said, I'm a little biased to obviously work with you, but like the strength training part of it, especially just training your, your bigger muscles that can make a huge difference. Um, in your glutes, your quads, core muscles, uh, the small different, like, you know, be, just a small increase in strength in those muscles, like I said with that guy, being able to go from not walking to, or not walk without a cane to ditching the cane to go hunt hunt some animals is a pretty mm-hmm. it makes a pretty big difference for these patients um versus uh you know being able to ride a, a stationary bike for a half hour mm-hmm. i think uh so I, and that's what's pretty cool to see like in the, the study that um dr holton did and then moving forward just how much emphasis they're putting on that mm-hmm. and uh with i met, met jason too with an incredible trainer too that's able to uh, you know work with these patients and kind of harness the energy that they bring and then kind of throws in his energy with it and strength training background and then I think it really makes it you know make a huge difference in a lot of these patients lives very very much so so I think you know part two the next version I think will focus even more on lower body stuff so our original pilot study was really full body mm-hmm. strength training which was good um, there's a lot of core work too I also required one minute of conditioning it was everyone's least favorite thing to do. <laughs> so I required uh, a one minute all out endless rope climb. Okay. Have you seen these machines? Yeah. Where you can sit down. Yep. I need to do something safe so they didn't tip over. <clears throat> but they would, they would sit on the machine and do an endless rope climb for one minute, all out effort, and then record how far they went. Mm-hmm. And to see week by week. Right. How yeah, that, improved. Yeah, how that made progress. And yeah, I got definitely the most complaints about that. I can imagine. <laughs> that minute. Um, but some conditioning down the road, it's a good intro to conditioning. They, they need some. Yeah. I wonder where like hit, you know, high intensity stuff wouldn't yeah. f- fit into that where yeah. again, it's quick, 
but seemingly effective right. per what all the research and whatnot that's coming on. Yeah, definitely. And it's not 45 minutes on a treadmill. It's maybe 10 minutes on a Airdyne. And, and you can Yeah, and you can get yeah. basically similar or better results. And yeah. mm-hmm. it's a whole lot less time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. So, yeah, part two, I think we'll still have a minute of conditioning. Yep. Um, like but even more so. lower body work. So just having seen how much that has helped some of our pilot study patients and how important that is for my patients in life, mm-hmm. you know, to get up out of a chair <laughs> sometimes is a big deal. You're right. Uh, to be able to go up and down stairs. So it's really, it's really the lower body and hips and glutes, quads that we need to be working on. For sure. So we're going to focus even more there. So I'm looking forward to seeing those changes. Yeah, that'll be in part three, really interesting. Part three will be the beach body muscles. There you yeah. Go. <laughs> Right. Well, once you start feeling really good yeah. with the basic yeah. stuff, then you just start throwing those in. Part three is signing up for the powerlifting meet. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, we were lucky to have Austin Brocky out here a few weeks ago from Barbell Medicine. Okay. And he said something to me that just really hit home, um, that in his life and in mine, I can reflect and have the same feeling. My life doesn't change if I can add five pounds to my squat. Nothing changes. Mm-hmm. I get it. You know, it would be nice maybe you know a little bit more pride or whatever but like nothing about my quality of life changes but if we can take someone who can't get out of a chair Mm -hmm. to be able to stand up on their own and be independent that is so so meaningful so whatever we can do to really rehabilitate and strengthen those muscles for our patients is probably where we need to focus and then after that then you know then the upper body can probably follow yeah but nothing matters more than your independence and oh, for sure. That's really what you need. All the ways you can put that together, you know, the press to help get up through with your legs and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so a lot more work to be done, but it's been fun to think about how to organize this for our patients and their families. So, yeah, we'll see where part two of the study goes. You know that, folks, another doctor that says you got to lift. <laughs> that's <laughs> what I like to hear. Yeah, definitely. So speaking of that, I still do lift. I still see the patients in the gym. Okay. So it's been more than six months since the, stu- since the study ended, the pilot ended. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the participants are still coming in. Some have changed gyms because it's more convenient for them. Makes sense. Totally yeah. fine. But pretty much everyone is still active, you know, six months on. And what's cool is they're still getting together. They're still supporting each other. And they're this, you know, nice little community now that can help each other be more resilient and you know, checking in with progress and that kind of mm-hmm. thing. So that, I didn't even realize that that would happen. And silly me, you know, I think of one patient at a time. Here, Here's your prescription, here's yours, here's yours. Right. But then I forgot, oh, yeah, they'll get together and they'll talk. <laughs> right. <laughs> they'll compare notes. Well, why are you doing this? So you I doing? think I should be doing that. <laughs> right? It's, it was pretty cool um, with Dr. Brocky here. He gave a talk um, and all, like, all of Dr. Holton's patients were invited to it that had gone through this or, um, and he gave a talk and you had all these, uh, post transplant patients that were asking him questions about how much, how often they can be lifting or what they should do to mm-hmm. And it's just like, I mean, just the excitement they brought, you know, compared to what you would typically think of, uh, like you mentioned before, someone that maybe has a hard time showering without getting out of breath. And yeah. here's these people badgering this, Doctor, just a ton of questions, like great <laughs> questions um, <laughs> about, uh, you know, what more they can do for mm-hmm. exercise and something like that. And that was a pretty, pretty cool event and cool thing to see. And what I, I hope is that the folks who are listening to this know that the patients that were at that meeting with Dr. Baraki or the folks who were on the pilot study, these were not super healthy people. In fact, you had to meet certain frailty criteria to even get on the study. So it was not like I handpicked the healthiest that I knew could endure right. anything. You know, this was just, this was real world folks who had all had very serious life-threatening complications of one thing or another, uh, and they had made it through, and they were at a point where it was time to focus on this, and, and they were able to do so. So it was not like this was, you know, just the healthiest. Everybody, no matter where they were, benefited. Hmm. And that's it, and that's really due to Jason knowing how to program for anybody. Right. So he can program for someone who is not able to walk seriously, yeah, 
all the way up to you know elite power lifters and everything in between and that's just really a special skill that's pretty cool mm-hmm. yeah it takes some insight definitely this <laughs> <laughs> is you would know Joel yeah <laughs> Everybody's got their unique little thing. You just gotta figure out what what gets them there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So he's he's a very motivating guy. He he knows how to inspire. And it's nice that a coach is open to that too, where it's not like, well, this is the program. Like, yeah, do it. It's gonna work for you. If it doesn't, it's probably your fault, not yeah. the programs. Yeah. Which yeah, he's take, it takes a lot for and it's applauding to have people that realize that yeah and he's really flexible and and takes the feedback and will make some modifications as needed and that's huge Um, but even so even my current program i still complain about it (laughs) isn't that a universal truth (laughs) that no matter what you're doing you need to complain about your program Mm -hmm. (laughs) i don't i don't think he'd be keep it fun that way (laughs) he probably wouldn't be doing his job if if you weren't complaining about the program i know well if i were writing my own program it would be a lot lighter yeah Oh, that's the reason I went back and started following the one again, because if I don't, I feel bad that he took the time to write it for me, so then it makes me go do the workout, yeah, I yeah, whereas I, I would just, like, blow it off otherwise, be like, yeah, well, I'm going to do something <laughs> later. I can let myself down. Yeah. yeah. That's true, right? I yeah. can totally let myself down. No, pr- I can phone it in, I can barely show up, that's fine. Yeah. But, but if it's someone else, if, I, if my coach wrote this for me, and I know I'm going to see him, and I'm going to see all my buddies, and you know they're gonna know yeah. <laughs> okay I better actually show up and do the work um, sometimes the numbers are nice too because it's almost like that challenge yeah I'm like well I did that last week so <laughs> <It's> definitely <laughs> I should be able to get this in theory yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah but isn't that what our patients need you know they, they need something more specific it's yeah. it's actionable it's like the, okay this is what I'm supposed to be doing not mm-hmm. me as their doc saying you should go exercise and maybe, you know, do 120 minutes of cardio per week. Right. What is that? You know, it's just not actionable. Yeah, Yeah, I think that's a great analogy, too, that you use. Like, you wouldn't hand a person a bottle of pills saying, (laughs) take them. There you go, good luck. (laughs) Yeah, right. Yeah, there's so many in there. Just do what you feel like here. (laughs) Feel it out. See, yeah. Yeah. Just to see what works for yeah. you. <laughs> Probably not going to. I would start well. slow. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. That's, that's a good one. That's spot on, honestly. Yeah. You know, how can we expect our patients to make big changes in their life without some guidance? Oh, and it's so confusing me today, mm-hmm. too, just with the amount mm-hmm. and the people that are out there trying to make a buck. Yeah. yeah. Just on everything, we're, we rail back against that as much as we possibly can. Yeah. That, Nothing's inherently wrong, but when it's financially motivated, it's probably not what you yeah, should be looking for. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Well, anything else like specific you wanted to cover? Um, anything else you wanted to cover? I, uh, let me see. I missed my computer shut down, so I don't have the questions. <laughs> You're all good. So we got the the five at the yeah, end. We got a lot of good things. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Jump into those? Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, good one. So I'm going to say what five questions that Joel always asks people first for me is what is something that you believe that others may not? It doesn't have to be health related. No, it can be. Yeah. So I was told ever since I was in Eric's shoes that a doctor could not be good at both patient care and research. So specifically, you know, I was told you can't be 50-50. You, you can't be half research, half patient care. You know, usually it's going to be massively in favor of one of the other to be good at it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't believe that's true at all. And fortunately, here in this culture at the University of Minnesota, people largely feel the same way here. Nationally, I don't think that's necessarily true. But here we are so fortunate to have leaders who who would support that so I'm able to do these fun programs like this research mm-hmm. we've, been, we've been talking about because I, I do have more time right. than someone who is seeing patients every day out of the week right so as an example of what my life is like um, I attend on the hospital service between 11 to 13 weeks out of the year something like that and then I see patients in the clinic one day per week so that's it for patient care. 
and this works because I have an incredible team surrounding me, mm-hmm. amazing nurse coordinators who have their finger on the pulse of every patient, right. um, advanced practice providers who can see patients on a daily basis as needed because I can't be there every day. And so they keep the ship running from the patient care standpoint. That frees me up to be able to dream and create. And all of this work is only meaningful if I can actually execute it and bring it right to patients. Right. So. I have ideas, I have a vision, I have the time to actually formulate that, put it on paper, fight for grants, try 10 times before I get one, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then eventually get get one, celebrate, and then you know get to work on the next thing. So my life is literally 50% research, 50% patient care. Nice. And I think they, they dovetail well, and they feed into, into each other really, really well. Um, so most people believe that you can't do that. Well, I'm, I'm doing it. For sure. And I'm going to keep doing it. I wouldn't blame you in the slightest. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Uh, most influential fitness purchase around 100 bucks or less. <laughs> so this is an easy one for me. This was my first pair of squat shoes. Nice. That changed my life. What kind do you have? <laughs> so my first pair ever were Innovates. And this was actually something my coach got for me. Okay. So this is the kind of guy he is. Um, If he sees potential in someone, even if that person doesn't see that potential, he's going to find a way to make sure that you know that that's there. Okay. So I've been training with him for a couple of years and, you know, just getting into barbell lifts. And he sees some potential there and suggests, you know, gently that maybe I should think about squat shoes, maybe maybe not the best ankle mobility, maybe you could think about some other ways that mechanically this would be helpful, and I was always like, nah, like, I'm, I'm just doing this for fun, this right. is not a big deal, I'm not going to spend money on this, well, <laughs> he just bypassed me and went ahead and got me nice. my first pair of squat shoes, and, you know, ever since then, I'm like, okay, you know what, I can do this, and maybe it is a little bit frivolous, but so what, this is fun. Yeah, of all the things you could get into, unless you're buying your own <laughs> set of plates and a bar, you're, it's not an overly expensive habit. No. no. So, it doesn't have to be. Yeah. So that was really cool. Like That absolutely changed my life and made me change my frame of thought of, this is just a minor thing in my life. You know, I, I don't deserve to spend money in, on myself in this way to, you love this. This is actually fun. Mm-hmm. And you're decent at it. <laughs> this helps you go for it. Like, go ahead. Have the squat shoes. Have have whatever else helps you lift. Get the belt. Get those things. So ever since then, um, yeah, I've been squatting three times a week and, and not looking back. There you go. And now I'm within, you know, just so close to setting a national record. If I could just... What would the record be? So I just have to squat more than 285 pounds. Okay. And I've done that. Okay. So can I do that in front of people in a singlet? <laughs> we'll see. Fair enough. Yeah. We'll see. People have asked if I would compete, and I'd say no, and they go, why not? I was like, well, I don't – I can compete by just maxing out myself and know what my numbers are, and that's yeah. fine. Like, I was like, if I'm going to go to a competition, I'm going like, to want to win. <laughs> but I weigh way too much, and I'm way too tall for like what some of these other guys would be able <laughs> sure. to do. And it's – I don't need that shout to my ego. I'm plenty yeah, happy with happy. where I'm at, and uh, as long as the numbers go up, I'm good. That's but, true. Yeah. yeah. And that is what it's about. You know, I never right. entered this competition thinking that I'm going to win this. That was never the goal. But it was interesting just looking at the national records of, holy crap, after this training that was just, just for me and for my health, look what happened. Mm-hmm. I showed it uh, every I'd, week, and this happened. I'd go for a record if I could pull it off, but... <laughs> So we'll see. It'll take a little bit of uh, miracle on the weight side, but we'll work on it. Yeah. You know a guy. I do. (laughs) Book recommendations? Book recommendations. Could be anything. We're always looking for another good book. Yeah. Um, Well, this is embarrassing. I hardly read. To be honest, I read maybe 15 minutes a night. Um, you got a couple things going I on. I can, under, I can understand that. Um, I, and I am embarrassed to admit that I wish I had read more. Um, I honestly, I spend way more time writing than reading. Okay. Um, so, you know, check me out on PubMed. That's where most of my time is spent. <laughs> I was going to say, like, <laughs> for your own writing or, like, yeah, no, research, medical, medical so or grants, papers. Makes yeah, sense. So I spend a lot of time writing. Um, but I do like to read. 
Um, I've got a couple of books on my bedside that I want to get into more. A recent one called Compassionomics, the concept mm-hmm. that compassion is kind of lost in medicine, and okay. if we can only just realize that it's more helpful than, than harmful, we yeah. need to kind of reinvigorate invigorate that. So that'll be a good read. Um, I have... Uh, a few other ones just for fun. Uh, Gary Taub's "Why We Get Fat." That's always okay. a good refresher. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it's a good I have. I, does he, I feel like he has like a talk. He's got a t- couple I'm books, sure. yeah, and probably a talk. Sorry, he had like a TED talk or something. I've heard of that yeah. before. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's been good. I just recently finished the Harry Potter series with my kids. Nice. Yeah. That's so good. when all that came back, I was you know in college and doing other things, uh-huh. <laughs> not reading Harry Potter. Yeah. So that was fun. I got through those. Of course, I highly recommend those books. Um, and then this is kind of trippy. I have two recent books that I actually appear in. So this is wild. This is kind of impact we can make in people's lives. Uh, you know, I never thought that this would happen. But, but here it is. Two of my patients have written books about their experience. Wow. Okay. And lo and behold, I'm in these books. Just as minor snippets. Yeah. Which is great because the, the book's about their lives. And right. I'm a small part of that. Fortunately, I appear to be a decent human in both of the books. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that, that worked out okay. Uh, one of those books is by Steve Beekler. Uh, the title of his book is How Steve Became Ralph. He named his stem cells Ralph. Okay. <laughs> so that's cool. <laughs> and then another by Shelley Nelson, Your Story is Your Medicine. Uh, she's like a nurse that. who has been through so much and just incredibly inspiring. So that's pretty wild. Those two are on my bookshelves. And every once in a while, I'll read a few pages and then cry real hard and then <laughs> be able to move on. So, Fair. yeah, that's what I've got. Yeah. Want me to keep rolling? Yeah. So this one... Um, in your area of expertise, and you can define that, how would you make something that is complicated simple? Yeah. I mean, this is pretty straightforward for me to deal with uh, in terms of the, the concept that needs to be made simple. Uh-huh. Anything related to clinical research, the number of people and barriers and roadblocks to get a clinical trial open is astronomical. Mm-hmm. And I get why we're here. We need safety. You know, we need considerations from the patient side that you know what we're asking them to do is reasonable has a chance to benefit them is safe will be monitored carefully I get all of that but the the regulations that are put in place really really make it hard so from the time I have an idea to the time I'm actually putting a patient on that study is about two years yeah and that just takes a lot of energy to keep at it um, so a lot of writing, a lot of revisions, a lot of scientific reviews, and then the IRB, and then all these other regulatory steps and all the paperwork. I wish that there was some way to greatly simplify that. Um, we're trying our best in our clinical trials office to streamline what we can, but that is something that we really have to do as a medical community, somehow make this simpler, because we all have awesome ideas, but how many of us really have the energy to see that through, to have the patience to, oh, yeah. to wait two years to even start to see a benefit. For sure. It's just a really long haul, really overly complicated, and something that we also have to work on. Ah, uh, it makes, makes sense. Yeah, frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the last one is, is if you could go back and tell yourself something in your training or your education, if you could go back 5, 10, whatever, you go ahead and set the stage you go back and tell yourself something what would what would it be well, that's a really hard question um i'm pretty happy with where i am right now but my road to get here was not linear by any stretch uh, i started as a music major realized that's a shift that, yeah realized, <laughs> you know I, and I didn't sing and i don't play anything <laughs> yet i really enjoyed music theory and writing Okay. So in, in producing, so I thought, okay, I can be like a music pr- producer. That would be go. fun. Realized quickly I don't have talent, and then <laughs> tried to figure out who I was from there, and just kind of organically took stuff that was interesting, and the the plan was clinical psychology or neuroscience. I leaned kind of towards the neuroscience end. Was enrolled in a PhD program, but before I started, I realized I can't actually do the lab because every time I kill a mouse, I cry. It's just too hard. 
you know, I totally understand why this is an important part of medical mm-hmm. research, and I, I don't want to say that that's bad, but it's not for me. I right. Can't, I can't kill mice. Yeah, I see. <laughs> it's too sad. <laughs> the reason I like working with college athletes, I can't say. <laughs> yeah. The research is pretty clear. Go ahead, like, there's yeah. not a whole lot going on. So then I, I just realized, okay, I guess I need to be around people, and, and what does that look like? Well, I guess that's medicine. Okay, let's apply there. So, um, you know, I was really late in figuring out that I wanted to be a physician. Um, and then going through that process, I was always confused on who who I was as, as a physician. I do like to see patients, but I really am not satisfied with the tools that we have to treat mm-hmm. them. It's just too frustrating for me. Um, so I guess maybe what I would have said to my former self is, you know, just be patient. You're going to figure it out. Um, so where I'm at now is ideal. I love seeing patients, but I love having the space to think mm-hmm. and plan and do clinical trials and actually advance the field. Um, and having some time for myself and my family, too. For sure. So I really have good balance now. I guess I would say just be patient and let it happen and be open and receptive and, and don't worry. You know, being very type A, I wanted to have it all figured out. Well, even my best efforts, I, I couldn't have known in high school or in college this is who I wanted to be. Right. But here I am, and, yeah, it's it's good. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Well, anything else? Not that I can think of. Thanks, you guys. If you wanted, if people wanted to, like, follow you or follow your work or get in touch, whatever you want to share there, it's up to you, but yeah, if they absolutely. did. Yeah, absolutely. W- I would love more connections. So a lot of my um, research I will post about on Twitter. My handle is SGHMD, so people can follow me on Twitter. I also post a fair number of dorky weightlifting videos. Nice. <laughs> So people can see where, I'm at. Worth follow. <laughs> see where I'm at with my training. Uh, so, yeah, Twitter is, is the place to, to follow me. Um, please do check out my publications on PubMed, though. I mean, that's really the heart of, of what I do. Um, everything that is a dream only matters if I actually make it happen and then disseminate it out there to the world. So For all sure. the stuff that really matters is out there on PubMed and hopefully one day changing practice all throughout the world. So I like it. Yeah. So you know, just minor things. Yeah. No big goals or anything. Yeah. Helps <laughs> you get out of bed in the morning. Yeah. You know, have something to go for. <laughs> for sure. Gives you something to do. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. Definitely. Thank you yeah. guys. It's yeah. a lot of fun. This is awesome. Thank you for checking out this episode of Clinically Pressed. Go to clinicallypressed.com for full show notes and links to everything that was covered in this episode. While you're there, you have access to all of our episodes, insights, and shorts. You can find Clinically Pressed on YouTube and any podcast outlet. If you could give us a rating, thumbs up, or review on how we are doing, we would greatly appreciate it. To get more free content delivered to your inbox, sign up for the Total Athletic Therapy Newsletter. You'll get direct links to all new clinically pressed episodes, reviews on some of the latest research in health and performance, and links to related podcasts and other items meant to help you make the complicated simple and optimize performance. Thank you for listening and see you next episode.